Welcome everybody. I'm Jane Lovino, the Sugden Curator of Education here at the museum. And you have joined us for Coffee with a Curator. We were just laughing about maybe it should have been Cocktails with a Curator. The, pro the title of today's program is The Lost Birds, and I'm really looking forward to talking to you about these sculptures and some of the stories behind them. But to start with, we want to just give you a little bit of background on, um, on this Zoom webinar. I'm sure many of you have been in Zoom meetings, but the Zoom webinar um, might be just a little bit different. So to start with, we want you to know that we cannot see you. <laughs> you can see us, it doesn't quite seem fair, but we cannot see you, nor can we hear you. So um, don't raise your hand or try to get our attention that way because we won't see it. However, there are some nice features here on Zoom webinar. If you bring your cursor down and look at the bottom of your screen, the first one I want to point out is the chat feature, which some of you have found already. It says chat and there's a little speech bubble. And if you click on that and then go to the bottom where it says to and click on all panelists and attendees, and then you can just tell us who you are, where you're joining us from. It will give us a sense of who is with us. And then the other feature I wanted to point out before we start is at the bottom of the screen, there's a uh, icon with two bubbles and it says Q&A. That's for question and answer. So we encourage you to use the chat just to say hello and say where you're from. But if you truly have a question at any point during the course of the presentation, use the Q&A button. We won't be stopping the program um, in the middle of the slides to field questions. However, Ali is going to be watching those questions and selecting some for me to field at the end of the program. So you can add questions at any time and then we'll just hold on to them and we'll address them at the end of the program. As I said, I'm Jane Lovino, Curator of Education. With me is Ali Shulin, and she is our Marketing Director. And I can't tell you how nice it is for me to have her here helping me with all any technical challenges that come up. So far, everything seems good. Ali's going to help me with the slides. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to start with uh, a little bit of introductions, a few, we have a few uh, audience polls to have some interaction back and forth, and then I will pop on at different times, and then we'll go from there. So I think, um, I think we're ready, Allie, for the first slide. Uh-huh. All right. So let me just get this load it up and again just to say kind of repeat uh what what jane said feel free to drop those questions into the q a at any time throughout the presentation it won't be distracting because i will be handling the questions and jane will be presenting so that we can kind of uh at any moment feel free to drop your questions in but there we go and i'm gonna Thank mute you. myself jane Okay, that's great. So I wanted to just say a little bit about myself. Hopefully most of you joined a little earlier and you heard me say my name is Jane Lovino. I'm the Curator of Education here at the museum. And I've been working at the National Museum of Wildlife Art here in Jackson, Wyoming for quite a long time, 28 years now. Hard for even me to believe that sometimes. I chose to talk today about the lost birds because I love the sculptures. I think they're beautiful sculptures and I really enjoy the stories behind each of the sculptures. So that's our plan for today is to look at the sculptures. The lost birds is an installation of sculptures on our sculpture trail and each bird has a story behind it. They are all birds that have become extinct in fairly recent years within the last 276 or so years, which is fairly recent. So let's go to the next slide, Ali, if we could. Before we dive into the lost birds, I've already told you a little bit about myself. Um, I actually grew up on, in New York on the East Coast. Um, I went to college in Maine, and there's a nice connection with Maine and with Bowdoin College where I went to school. We'll get to that in the program. But we'd like to know a little bit more about who is with us today, who you all are. So Allie is going to drop in um, an audience poll and choose the one that seems to be most 
applicable to you, whether you live nearby, whether you visited our museum, whether you live far away, whether you hope to visit our museum sometime, and then uh, also choose why you are with us today, whichever one seems most in line with the reason why you decided to join us today. And so as everyone is adding their answers to those questions, Allie will be watching as they come in. And once they're all in, we will gen it will generate the program, this nice little program we're on will generate the results. So we'll all get to share and see who's with us today. Looks like we're about 60% of you guys have voted and they're still streaming in slowly. So there's a lot a to read. Seconds. Yeah. <laughs> It's helpful for us because, like I said, we can't see you, you can see us. So it's really nice for us to learn a little bit more about you. It will help me to know what things to focus on and emphasize once I get into the program. All right, we're getting close. We got about 82% of the vote in. If anybody wants to sneak in a vote real fast, next couple seconds here. All right, let's see. Okay. Here we go, Jane. Can you see that all right? I can. I can. So it looks Ooh, like that's interesting. There, there's nobody who lives nearby but has never visited the museum. I love seeing that. Thank you all <laughs> for visiting the museum. And quite a few people who live far away have visited the museum. And uh, it's nice to see that even if you live far away, some of you really do hope to visit someday. We'd love to see you here. And interesting that um, some people are here, a lot of you are for the art, some for the biology. I should have said biology also, of course, includes ornithology, which is specific to the birds, because that is what we'll be talking about. Quite a few of you are, in, are interested in this specific topic. I love that. Thank you, Allie. You can go ahead and close that. And the next slide we can bring up. And this one shows the artist, Todd McGrain, is the sculptor who created the Lost Bird sculptures. And he was at our museum, oh, about seven years ago when the Lost Bird sculptures first came to our museum. He came and helped locate them and decide how he wanted them to be arranged outdoors on our sculpture trail. A little bit about him, Todd McGrain, is from New York. He, for a long time, was artist in residence at Cornell University. I'm not quite sure if he is still doing that. He um, is best known probably among his, for his sculptures for the Lost Bird Project. Those are the only works of his that we do have at our museum, but we have five of them, so that's pretty good. Um, let's go to the next slide. And this shows our museum building. For those of you who have never been here before, the top slide shows how we're located up on a hillside just north of the town of Jackson, overlooking the National Elk Refuge. And then beneath that, you can see the five lost bird sculptures. That's me sitting in the amphitheater to give you a little bit of scale there. Um, I want to point out that there are uh, the five, the five sculptures, I'll, while we're on this slide, the next slide I think didn't capture all five. So while we're on this slide, I want to name all of the birds for you. The one all the way to the right is the great auk. The next one to the left of that is the passenger pigeon. To the left of the pigeon is the Labrador duck. Thank you, Ali, for your cursor. To the left of the Labrador duck is the heath hen. And then in the background is the passenger pigeon. So these birds are all birds that have become extinct fairly recently within the past 276 years or so. They are, they're beautiful. You can see they are fairly big. They are created out of bronze, and each one has its own extinction story. And we're going to delve into these stories a little bit. Let's go to the next slide, Ali. This close up with me standing there again for scale gives you a little bit better sense of the beautiful texture of these bronze sculptures. I always like to start when you're looking at a work of art, and I do this myself when I'm looking at a work of art for the first time, 
just give it some time initially. Don't jump to any conclusions. Just let it sink in. Uh, spend some time looking at the shapes, some time looking at, you know, noticing what questions maybe come to mind, what thoughts or feelings are evoked, and what comparisons you might make. So one thing that I want to point out, if we had time, I would you know, have you put some of your thoughts in the chat box there. But in view of time, maybe you noticed that these sculptures are all very smooth. They are lacking um, de fine detail, like you don't see the feather patterns, for example. Todd McGrain says he intentionally wanted to create these smooth, somewhat abstracted forms, yet they're still recognizable because he compared it to um, polished river stones that had been tumbled in the riverbed for a while, their edges worn off. And to him, a, a smooth river stone makes you think about the passage of time and memory. And he wanted these sculptures that allude to extinct birds to be able to tap into memory and the passage of time. Another thing you might notice is the beautiful patina or the finish on the bronze. He's decided to make them black, which, you know, of course, the artist can use um, chemicals and create any patina they wish to have on the bronze. It could have been brown, it could have been green. He went with the black, which has a beautiful luster. Another thing that I find really interesting in looking at these sculptures is the scale. So if you look at them, you can see they're taller than I am. I'm about five, five and a half, and these birds are maybe six, two, about the same height as Todd McGrain, the artist. And you'll also notice they've all been scaled up from, you know, at, of course, from much bigger than actual size, but you may also notice that they're not scaled up to the same degree. In other words, the Carolina parakeet is almost as big as the uh, heath hen, for example. And I asked Todd McGrain when he was here, what was the reason for that? Why did he decide to do that? And he said he wanted people to have an immediate reaction to them when they stand in front of them as if you're talking to another person. So he increased them all to be equivalent to a human scale. And he wanted you to be able to walk up to them and not feel like you were dominating them nor they were dominating you. He wanted there to be this interchange, this connection between the two species. And I thought that was really interesting. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So in the next slide, there's a book there. And this is the book the artist said he was reading when he got inspired to do this project. It's by Chris Kokinos, and I have read sections of it. It's really fascinating. It includes the extinction stories of all of the five birds in the sculpture series, as well as some others. And it's really well researched. I, I, I recommend that if you're interested in this, check out this book. But another thing that I find interesting is just where artists get their inspiration. So Todd McGrain was reading this book. He got interested in the stories. He decided to visit the locations where each of these birds was last known to exist in the wild. And when he went to each of these sites, he started getting this strong feeling that each of these locations should have sculptures installed as a memorial to the bird that was last seen in that location. So if we go to the next slide, you can see the map of North America and you can see the silhouette of each of the five lost birds, uh, starting at the upper right, the great auk, the last place it was known to exist before becoming extinct was Fogo Island off the coast of Newfoundland. Moving down the heath hen, was last known to exist on Martha's Vineyard off the coast of Massachusetts. The Carolina par parakeet in Florida, uh, 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 Oka near Okeechobee, Florida, but um, the sculpture is located at the Kissimmee Prairie Preserve, which is down there. The passenger pigeon last known to live in Columbus, Ohio, and then the Labrador duck in Elmira, New York. So that just gives you a sense if you're ever traveling, you may come across these sculptures and it's almost like a tombstone. And I love the idea of people traveling to these locations, not knowing anything about 
these birds or their history and then seeing some signage there and learning about the history and becoming interested in it. So in addition to having one of each of these sculptures at the National Museum of Wildlife Art, there exists one in each of these locations. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so the great auk is the first one that we're going to talk about. And the slide on the left shows the great auk on site at the National Museum of Wildlife Art. The one on the right shows how it looks, how it's situated off the coast of Newfoundland. And a little bit about, um, if we go to the next slide, you're gonna see a color image of the great auk, and then I'll tell you a little bit about it. This was before photography. So if, we, you, know, if you wanna see what the plumage was like, you really do need to refer to artist renderings of the bird. So the, the great auk was a flightless bird, kind of like a, you know, similar to a penguin in that way. It was a seabird. Uh, it mated and reared its young on the isolated islands off of the North Atlantic. It was um, a very sought after fresh meat source and that was what led to its extinction. Explorers, people in boats off the coast, sailors, would they couldn't catch them in the water because they were great swimmers, but when these birds went on shore to rear their young and you know lay their eggs and rear their young, that was when they were easily caught and then killed for their meat. So they started being, the numbers started being greatly reduced. In those days, you could find their meat sold in fish markets, and they were also killed for their feathers. The downy feathers were used to stuff pillows. So that is what led to the demise of the great auk. Let's go to the next slide. And we're gonna talk about the Labrador duck next. Again, you see on the left, the sculpture on site at our museum and on the right where it is memorialized in Elmira, New York. This bird became extinct in 1878. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see a color artist color rendering and you can see the female on the left with the brown plumage and the male on the right with the black and white striking feathers. It was sometimes called the skunk duck because of its black and white plumage. And it's not completely understood why this bird became extinct. It's not, it was not because of the meat, because apparently the meat did not taste very good because of the shellfish that the Labrador duck ate. It, um, not many people liked to eat the meat, although some did. It was called poor man's food because it wasn't very tasty. The decline is most likely linked to a, a change in its food source. So the food that it, that it fed on was um, mussels or uh, shellfish that were off the coast of the, of the Atlantic on the eastern seaboard. And as more and more people started inhabiting the, you know, those settlements on the east coast, they started wanting to eat those shellfish as well. And also pollution in those shallow waters off the coast was an issue. So that is what led to the extinction of the Labrador duck. They couldn't find their food source anymore. And they were so specialized that they weren't able to adapt or evolve fast enough to um, start eating other foods. So that is really what drove them um, to extinction. The last one was, they th you know, for years they thought it was extinct already. There was a rapid decline. And then a boy in Elmira, New York, was out hunting one day and he saw a duck that he was unfamiliar with. It had been blown in by a storm into you know, more inland in New York and he shot it and brought it home and someone recognized it as the Labrador duck and that was the last one that anyone ever is known to have seen. Um, and that's why that sculpture is located in Elmira, New York. Let's go to the next slide. And that's the passenger pigeon. I'm guessing that for most of you, the passenger, if you, you know, if you're, if you were familiar with any of these birds, the passenger pigeon may have been one that you had heard of before. It was a bird that if we go to the next slide, you can see had beautiful plumage, beautiful coloring. And if you look at the slide on the right, you can start to get a sense of how many billions and billions of these birds there were. 
It's hard for us to imagine. Their story is somewhat similar to the American bison. So many billions, I mean, bison, we say millions, but for passenger pigeons, it was truly billions. And early explorers said that if you were out there and a flock was migrating overhead, it would blot out the sun and almost would feel as if there was an eclipse. They said that some flocks were several miles wide and as much as 250 miles long. It would take days for a migrating flock to pass overhead. Um, I wanna give you a quote from John James Audubon. He said he once watched a flock that took three days to pass overhead and the dung that fell in spots like melting flakes of snow was disorienting. Passenger pigeons were killed for food and also purely for sport. When the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, the pigeoneers or people who hunted pigeons for a living were able to increase their markets and get more pigeons to more markets and that you know, made it even more profitable to go out and shoot pigeons. They could get them to these more distant markets without spoiling as quickly. They became very um, efficient at killing pigeons, sim again, similar to the American bison. They would have a pigeon tethered to a stool. You probably heard the term stool pigeon. As a flock was passing overhead, they would throw it up in the air and it would flutter, signaling to the flock overhead to descend onto the field. And then as soon as the huge flock descended, the hunters would cover it with a big net and then they would um, kill the pigeons once, once they couldn't escape. So, you know, really, really efficient. And the numbers, people thought they could never become extinct. There were just so many of them, but they did, their numbers dwindled and dwindled. And then um, ironically, the last one, very similar to the Labrador duck, was killed by a teenage boy out hunting, at least the last one known to exist in the wild. Then there was a pair of them, a male and a female who were in the Cincinnati Zoo and the, the female outlived her mate. Uh, people loved these birds and she was named Martha and Martha passed away in her cage and that was then truly the extinction of the passenger pigeon. We can go to the next slide. The Carolina parakeet you can see it on the left at the museum and on the right in Florida at the Kissimmee Prairie Preserve. And then if we go to the next slide, you will see why it became extinct. Notice the beautiful colored feathers, the green and the yellow and the red. This parakeet was killed for its feathers. I mean, there were other contributing factors, but that was the big one. During the um, Victorian era, it was very popular for women to wear hats adorned with feathers. They um, were also, you know, used to adorn capes and men's hats, all kinds of things. A little bit hard for us to understand, but um, it was extremely popular. So many, many of these birds were killed for their feathers. There were also some that um, died due to habitat loss because of deforestation. Trees were cut down for fuel and lumber and the, then the nesting sites as well as the natural food sources of nuts, berries and seeds um, disappeared. And uh, the uh, birds then started eating the grain from farmers' fields. They became an easy target for farmers because they're such a communal species that when one would be shot and would fall from the sky, the whole flock would descend to its side, whereupon they would all be shot. So that's another sad story about the, uh, the passenger pigeon. If we go to the next slide, I have an image there of a Victorian woman with a hat. And you can see not only the feathers were used for decoration, but sometimes the whole bird. Again, hard for us to understand, but they would probably not understand some of our fashions. Let's go to the next slide. And this is our fifth bird. I've put them in order of, you know, the one that was, became extinct the longest ago to the one that was, became extinct most recently. And that is the heath hen. It became extinct in 1932. 
And you can see uh, on location where the memorial is, it is on Martha's Vineyard. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see from the artist's rendering that it really had some beautiful plumage. It once inhabited areas from Maine to the Carolinas. The heath hen was a very popular food source, so popular that indentured servants during colonial times felt the need to have it written into their contracts that they could only be served heath hen two to three times per week. They didn't want to get sick of it. Um, and I guess because it was easy to catch and it was an inexpensive bird that, ha you know, that could happen. The birds could be found only on Martha's Vineyard by 1870. During that time, local officials on the vineyard banned hunting and established a preserve to protect the remaining habitat, which was very um, advanced for that time. For a while, the numbers increased and things were looking better, but then a fire, uh, a wildfire destroyed much of the habitat and most of the birds, leaving only about 150 individuals left. And by a, by a stroke of bad luck, about three-fourths of those were um, uh, males and only about one-fourth of those was, were females. So you started having um, inbreeding and not enough genetic diversity. There was bottlenecking and then a spiraling of the population until they um, only knew of, you know, a handful were left and then only one was left. And then for the last maybe two or three years, um, there was only one left. The people living on Martha's Vineyard, as well as some Bowdoin College professors came coming down from Maine, were banding the birds. They banded the last one. The islanders were so fond of this last one known to exist, they named him Booming Ben. And he was called Booming Ben because of the mating call. So in the spring when they were doing their mating call on the lek or the breeding grounds, the males would come and strut around and there's a air pouch. You can see that uh, orange circular thing on the side of the bird's neck. They would fill that up with air and make this booming sound. And typically the heath hen would, when they're in that mating call phase, they would go up into the lower branches of the tree. But Booming Ben, when he was the last one left, he would go up to the tippy top of the tallest tree and he would do his booming display, kind of calling out into oblivion, hoping to attract a mate, but there was no one out there to hear his call. And then eventually Booming Ben disappeared. They weren't exactly sure what happened to him, whether you know a car hit him or a, a fox or a something like that got him, but um, Booming Bam was the last one. And he was, you know, the, the uh, Islanders missed him terribly after he left. Let's, uh, let's go, Allie, to a screen of me instead of that next slide. If we can switch back to seeing me here. There we go, thank you. And I wanna switch gears a little bit here because we've looked at the histories, we've, we've listened to the stories of what happened to these birds. And the question I want to ask is, why should we care about these stories today? Today, um, some of you may be aware that today extinction is looming even more as a fear for many species than it was 200 years ago. The extinction rate among insects and birds and other animals, it seems to be accelerating. This is due, of course, to some of the same reasons that these birds died off. Habitat loss is certainly one, but also climate change seems to be accelerating um, the rate of extinction. With the Lost Bird Project, Todd McGrain wanted us to think about the finality of loss by extinction. And he also urges us not to forget because he says, forgetting is another kind of extinction. Since Todd made the Lost Bird sculptures 10 years ago, much has advanced in the field of genetic engineering. And scientists from around the world are working now to bring some of the lost birds and other species such as the woolly mammoth back to life. So now we're gonna switch gears and talk about this idea of 
de-extinction, meaning becoming unextinct, or also it's sometimes called resurrection biology, which is a prettier word. Let's go back to the next slide and talk about that for a few minutes. Okay, so this slide is a photo I took of my husband, Ed, a few years ago. We were at the Royal British Columbia Museum in Victoria, and it's a full-sized model of a woolly mammoth. And some of you may, may know that scientists have discovered the bones and the tusks of woolly mammoths, but certainly not whole animals like this one. So I should clue you in that this is a fabricated woolly mammoth. It's made from metal and foam. The tusks are made from fiberglass. Um, and also the hides of nine musk oxen were used to give it its woolly fur. I love how visitors at this museum can pose in front of the diorama and they can imagine what it might have been like to be in the presence of these creatures. This just gets us thinking about this whole concept. Let's go to the next slide. And Ali, on this one, you're gonna need to click a couple of times, but think about, you know, is it possible to bring these animals back and should we want to? Go ahead and click again, Ali, and you'll start to see some of the names of the animals that scientists are working on on this de-extinction biology right now. The woolly mammoth, the heath hen, the passenger pigeon, the auric, the dire wolf, the Carolina parakeet. These are all um, being worked on the, the, you know, the science behind it right now. But we're gonna talk about the heath hen. And the reason for that is because I think maybe the heath hen might be the first one, if any of them ever come back, it might be the first one. And I'll tell you why. Let's go to the next slide. And on this slide, you can see on the left, a still life painting here at the National Museum of Wildlife Art by artist Alexander Pope. And then on the right, you can see a photograph of Alfred Gross. He was one of the Bowdoin professors who became really interested in the species um, in its final days. And he's holding one that he has put a band on in that photo. And he's also, um, uh, he also, there is a video, if you, if you search for it online, I'm not going to show it now, but there's a video of him that exists, of him actually banding Booming Ben, the last one that was known to exist, that is pretty fun to watch. If we go to the next slide, you will see, I'm going to catch up to you here, some specimens, and you can see a stuffed a uh, heath hen on the left and then some study skins on the right and then let's um so basically i want to give a little bit of information here about how it works like how do you bring the heath hen back from some dead specimens so i'm not gonna i'm no expert on this but i'm going to tell you that basically um the heath hen traits um, are in the DNA that can be extracted from these specimens. And there are over 100 specimens of heath hens in natural history museums around the world. And so the DNA can be extracted from the specimen and it can be inserted into the genome of a closely related species, which in this case would be the greater prairie chicken, which is sort of a cousin to the heath hen, but it is still existing. Um, so they're close enough that their genes can be combined and then you end up with a bird that has some traits um, of both. And then when these birds breed, the bird that results will have the traits of the heath hen. So that's in a really quick nutshell, that's how you do it. Don't ask me too many questions or I will get them wrong. Let's go to the next slide. And then you can see here's some reasons why I think that the heath hen, hen might be the first to become resurrected. There are over 100 specimens, as I said, that exist in the museums. The DNA is in good shape, it's not fragmented. Number two, they have only been extinct for 88 years. Uh, again, the DNA is still good. 
It has a very close living relative, the greater prairie chicken, which is important not only for the genetic engineering, but also because once these heath hens hatch out, they need a close relative to be the surrogate parent to, um, to teach them how to be heath hens, how to be uh, prairie chickens or whatever they are. Um, and so that's important. And number four, the return of the heath hen seems to have strong human support and funding. There's a group of people on um, Martha's Vineyard who really would like to see this happen. The habitat on Martha's Vineyard still exists and people believe the reintroduction would actually benefit the habitat by making it more diverse. So we can go to the next slide now and we're going to do another audience poll. So our question for you is, what do you think of bringing the heath hen back? And I'm being specific to the heath hen because you might feel one way about the heath hen and feel another way about the woolly mammoth. But in terms of the heath hen, do you like the idea? Do you not like the idea? Do you have mixed feelings about it? Go ahead and choose the one that best or most closely matches how you're thinking. And then number two, if you chose you like the idea, um, then tell us why. There's a series of options there. Tell us why you think it might be a good idea or you you know, might be in favor of that. So go ahead, once everybody has voted, Ali's gonna take a look and it will be fun to see what people are saying. Hey Jane, how similar is a heath hen to a chicken? Do you know? Like the chickens like that we know. Domestic <laughs> chicken? I yeah. mean, there are certainly some similarities, um, you know, it's not as close as to like probably the sage grouse that we have here in Wyoming would be closer and certainly the greater prairie chicken is closer. So I'm guessing they're distantly related, but not super close related. Okay, just curious because it <laughs> had the head in the name. Our audience knows more than I do about it. <laughs> oh, so while you're going through this poll, it is a little interesting interesting because you essentially have to choose a, a, a choice for each question. Okay. So if you chose the like, um, you want the heath hen back, you can choose an answer for the second one. And then the third one, you would just have to choose that very last option of I like the idea or no opinion. Okay, so yes. you have to vote for something. In other for words. something. <laughs> okay. Or you could say that you have no opinion across all three questions as well, if you'd like. Okay, that works. It looks like we've got about 50% of the vote in. So if everybody kind of keeps on voting, we'll give it a couple more seconds here. Okay. I know when I was creating these polls, some of them got a little bit wordy, but <laughs> this is a good learning experience for us too. Lisa, you, when you create yours on your presentation, you can make it less wordy than I did for this one here. Well, I have to say the Jurassic Park reference, that's the first thing I thought of when you said the, the resurrection, biological resurrection. <laughs> I do. There is something I like about that term, resurrection biology. Mm -hmm. It just sounds so much prettier than de-extinction. <laughs> yes. Uh, we have another quick question that came through the, the chat here. Is that the heath hunt is specific to Martha's, Martha's vineyard only, correct? Is that what we said? Uh, it's in, it used to be all the way up and down the um, eastern seaboard, but uh, then it was only on Mount Martha's Vineyard right before it became extinct for the last, I don't know, seven or eight years or so. It was only found on Martha's Vineyard. Okay. Awesome. So it looks like the answering has slowed down. I'll give you a couple more seconds if anybody wants to sneak in their answers here and we'll see. And one, one of the reasons why the, the people who live on Martha's Vineyard who would like to see it come back, they say another advantage to bringing it back there is not only do they still have the habitat, but they, uh, they're somewhat protected by being an island. Mm -hmm. All right, so with the vote, let me share this. Ooh. Oh, they like the idea. 53% like the idea. 40% have mixed feelings about it, 5% don't like the idea, 1% not sure about it. And then for those of you who like the idea, um, a, quite a few of you, 38% said that you would like to restore historic habitats and ecological balance. Um, there were some other 
if you if you have some other and don't mind putting it in the chat section it would be fun to hear what your other reasons are um, and those who don't like the idea there are too many unknowns i totally agree with that i have mixed feelings about it myself and part partly you know why i do have mixed feelings is because there are so many unknowns um, and then also uh, you know it's interesting to me but this is a really valid worry and i think about this too if we bring them back will people say let's not worry so much about extinction because we can always bring them back it's um it's a valid concern thank you all so much for participating that's fun to see yeah all right very okay. cool well, i think what we're going to do next ali is um go to my last let's see here no actually go back to keep on the one where you are now maybe yeah. let's do the question and answer now while we're on this screen oh that's okay so we're back on the no that's okay go to the slide 28 if you don't mind this could be done in any order so mm -hmm. i know some of you might be short on time so we did want to squeeze this in before we went to q a but if you can stay for q a please do because often that's the most interesting part and ali has been curating your questions for me and i can't wait to hear what they are but what before you leave and before we go to q a um, I wanted to let you all know that the museum will be reopening on June 2nd. That's Tuesday of next week. It will be a soft opening, so it will only be five days a week for only four hours a day to start with. But you know what? The sculpture trail is open for a longer period of time and you don't have to pay anything. So if you just want to come up to see the lost bird sculptures, you can come anytime to see them. Okay. So now as we're going to you go stay to six feet apart on the sculpture trail, Jane. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, six oh. feet apart. Thank you, Allie. <laughs> so Allie's going to look at the Q&A that comes up, and she is going to um, tell me which questions to answer. Thank you, Allie. Yes, of course, of course. overwhelming trying to read through them and decide. And we do, we have, uh, this is still open, so if anybody has any, any questions, feel free to click on that. It's the Q&A, so it's down at the bottom there next to the, to the participants, or maybe you don't even see that, but Q&A in chat. Right. Um, so one of the first questions that came in here, Jane, let's see. So Jane, how do you feel, how do you feel the sculptures power their power their effect on on viewers change as they go from the group all together like at the museum versus when they're seen in solidarity in the places Ooh. they were last known that's a really good question and i'll say first of all i feel that they are very powerful sculptures people do enjoy them here at the museum but it seems like the stories are really important and the stories are out there on labels and they're also on the audio tour that people can listen to but i have a feeling that at the museum a lot of people walk right past them and miss that i tend to believe that if you come across them on these locations and read the story the story might have a more powerful effect because you're standing right there and it's it's like this tombstone and you i have i have not seen any of these on their locations but i have a feeling that it's really powerful to come across them there and then get caught up in the stories. Um, in general, I think art is a really good way to talk about some of these scientific ideas and, you know, not just extinction, but, you know, other types of stories as well. Um, art is kind of a universal language and it speaks to people on a really strong emotional level. And I just feel like these sculptures, the, it was a fabulous idea he had, and I think they are powerful. Um, and people, I know it's true of myself. I didn't, I knew I'd heard of the passenger pigeon. I'd maybe heard of a couple of the other birds, but the stories behind them, I had no idea. And just like the artist, the sculptures got me interested in the stories. Yeah, and having them all together like that too. I mean, it just speaks to, maybe destruction is a little harsh, but how humans have impacted the environments that we've lived in. And, you know, me too, I've heard some of these stories, but hearing them all back to back, Jane, is, it's it's very eye-opening of how, you know, we've handled birds. Yes. <laughs> right, right. Um, so another question that 
you, uh, how long are the sculptures at the museum? We own them, correct? Oh yeah, so that's a great question. So they came to the museum for the first time about, I think it was seven years ago, and it was a temporary exhibition called The Lost Birds. And they were only supposed to be here for the summer and then travel to other locations. But when we saw them here, our you know collector circle, which is a high level of membership and a collect, they have a collecting duty and task. They purchased some of them, and individual donors wanted to purchase others. So fairly quickly, all five were purchased for the permanent collection, and now they're here on permanent display out on the sculpture trail across from the front entrance of the museum. And then do you know how many editions of the large one, large of the collection of all five there are? I don't, and that's a good question. I was trying to find that out and I did, you know, I did come across some information that they continue to travel, but I don't know how many editions. If I had to guess, I might say not too many because it's expensive to cast that many sculptures and they're heavy and they're hard to move. They were cast at, um, a foundry in New York, in Newburgh, New York, and they, you know, it's just, a, I was here when they were installed on the sculpture trail, and you need a crane, and you need a special truck, and if I had to guess, I might say there exist maybe one or two groups of them that continue to travel around the country, in addition to the ones we have here, and in addition to the ones that are as memor memorials on location. Gotcha. And then speaking of the casting process, we have a question of what is the finish on the bronze? Do you know uh, a bit about the patina there? Yeah, so yeah, the casting process, it's the lost wax process, which is an ancient casting method. You have to do it in a foundry. There have to be, you, the artist doesn't do it himself. There are artisans who work with the artist. Um, the, the bronze comes out really shiny. The, it, bronze is, a, is an alloy, a mixture of metals. And then the artist decides on the patina. So the patina is determined by a mixture of chemicals, depending on what you want that finish to be. And then these chemicals are applied and then oxidized with heat and they become a permanent shell or surface or patina on the surface. And uh, there's a, some artists have their own chemical mix and it, it's a well-kept secret. Other artists, they you know, share it with other people, but you can choose anything from brown to green to black to you know, anything in between in terms of that patina. Um, the sculptures, once they're located, especially if they're outdoors, they have to be regularly coated with a protective wax to protect them from the elements. And these were, are, are looking really nice out on our sculpture trail because last summer they were coated with a new coat of wax. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's a lot of chemistry for me. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna keep looking through the questions here because we've got a few more coming in. Um, oh, the artworks that we showed of the bird drawings by Coolerman, if I'm saying that correctly, mm -hmm. are those from the National Museum's collection, the National Museum of Wildlife? Oh, good question. Those are not. I found those on the internet and I thought they were particularly good at showing the uh, colors and the plumage. We do have quite a few of these birds depicted in our permanent collection. And off the top of my head, I will say, um, we have for sure several images of the Carolina parakeet. We have the passenger pigeon. We have the heath hen. I don't think we have the Labrador duck or the great auk, but I could be wrong about that. But three out of five isn't too bad. Mm. Um. Let me see, I'm just going through a few more here. Of course, I wasn't counting the Lost Bird sculptures. If you count the Lost Bird sculptures, we have all of them. Have in them our all, exactly. <laughs> um, we have a question, uh, your slide that had the extinction animals. Do you know what a quagga is? The oh, Q that's a good question. <laughs> it's like a horse-like or zebra-like um, animal in Africa. Okay. And I, other than that, I don't know much. I've seen pictures um, of what it looked like, and it looked a lot like a small zebra. But um, aside from that, I do not know. Okay. <laughs> it's just an interesting word, quagga. 
Um, oh, we have here from Jenny Pascal. She said that her grandfather was Norm McClintock, who captured a Heath Hen courtship on Martha's Vineyard. Are you aware if his films are available on the internet? Ah, okay. So I did, um, in reading the book that I put up there um, uh, by Chris, I can't remember his last name. Uh, anyway, <laughs> when I was reading the sections of that book, I did see um, McClintock listed there. And I thought that it was really interesting. He was one of, he created films of these Heath Hens when they were still existing. And I looked for his films and I was not able to find any of them. Uh, but it was fascinating to read that one of the things he did in order to capture the films he did of the mating displays and so forth was he was fearful that the uh, movie camera that he had had a loud clicking noise. Mm -hmm. And so he went to the lek before he filmed on it and he put uh, one of those old fashioned wind up ticking alarm clocks out in the lek so the birds would become habituated to that ticking noise and not be scared by it and they did get habituated to it so then he was able to come with his movie camera which also made a clicking noise and he was able to capture the mating display without um scaring the birds off which i thought was really smart and really yeah. interesting the only live footage that i was able to find was by that bowden professor whose picture i put up there and if you do a search for him um bowden college and heath hen you will come to um, something that bowden college has published fairly recently within the last year or two and you will see some of that scientists footage and the one that I really enjoyed looking at showed it starts with a blind and you can see this guy run out of the blind and run to where they have a trap in front of the blind and he he's running so fast that he skids in the grass and he <laughs> falls and he picks up the heath hen and then you can see him holding it and being filmed and he and his uh uh, partner, another scientist who was with him, both took turns. At that point, they knew it was the last Heath Hen. It was Booming Ben, and the, it's fascinating old footage. But if you do a search, Bowdoin College, Heath Hen, you should be able to find that footage. But I'm not aware of any other footage. And that was found fairly recently in someone's attic, and it has become part of the Bowdoin College archives. Wow, isn't it crazy the things that people find in their attics yeah. and what they have that they didn't even right. know. That's so interesting. Um, so it looks like I've got a couple more questions, but just to say we've got about eight more minutes. So if you have any other questions, we might be able to get to them. So feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Um, let's see, oh, uh, do we have any plans to acquire any other of Todd's sculptures or his new sculpture? Mm, that's a good question. So I tried to do a little bit of research to find out what he's working on right now. And after he, so after he finished the sculptures, he was really caught up in that Lost Bird project and doing a lot of lecturing. And he created a film, I think it's called The Lost Bird Project. And it's a whole, you know, almost a feature length film. It's a just under an hour and I watched it recently. So he was really involved in the making of that film. And if you go to Vimeo and search for the Lost Bird Project, you'll be able to bring up that film and you can rent it for, I think it's $4.99 or $5.99. Anyway, I rented it a couple nights ago and I really recommend it. And in that film, you'll see he's not only acting in the film, but he was really involved in making decisions about that film and producing it. So after that film was made, he got really interested in film as an art form. And he actually went back to film school in New York. He went to the School of Visual Arts, got a degree in film, and his next artistic project was a film on elephants that is also available now. I have not watched it, but he's for the past year or two or maybe more has been putting his artistic energy into film production instead of into making sculptures. So I, I, we have no plans to acquire um, any more of his sculptures at this time, but if he starts making sculptures again, I would be interested and as I'm sure our curator of art, art and her colleagues would be interested in seeing them as well. Interesting. Those videos might make a fun time in the auditorium too, maybe one day. 
right? All right, guys. So this will be the final question, Jane. Okay. Would the bringing back of some of these extinct species have a positive impact on the environment and improve climate change? Ooh, that mm. is a very good question. <laughs> so I, I don't know for sure, and someone who is a scientist would be able to answer it better than I, but, <laughs> and this is a big but, but <laughs> I think bringing them back would improve um, the diversity of the habitat, which could potentially have a positive effect on climate change. Okay, okay. And yeah, I am sure, like we saw in the poll, just there are a lot of unknowns whenever you bring a bird, an animal yeah. back when it hasn't been. Right. Awesome. Those are great questions. Yes, so we're right, we've got about five minutes, but we can cut it a little short okay. here. Thank you everyone. Thank you Jane so much for all this amazing information. I had not heard, heard a lot of these stories, so I'm really excited for that. Um, and thank you for everybody that attended. Yes. We will have a follow-up too as well. I'll send out an email that'll have the recording of this. And if you have any other questions, um, my email is Allie, A-L-L-I-E at wildlifeart.org. Or if you wanted to email Jane, that's J Lavino, L-A-V-I-N-O at wildlifeart.org. And I just wanted to say thank you, Allie. Allie's been a wonderful um, co-worker to help me with this program. I can't tell you how at ease it is knowing I'm not in charge of all the technology. And I wanted to remind you all to stay safe and wear your mask. Oh, <laughs> you had a, monk, a munch mask the entire time? Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> I painted that one for my husband. <laughs> oh, I love it, I love it. Okay, thank guys. You. Well, thank you so much. You all have a wonderful Thursday. Stay, stay safe and enjoy the weather. Bye. Thank you. Bye.